Tonight we're going to talk about some common garden diseases. Um, the first thing we're going to do though is talk a little bit about how plants get diseases, uh, what are the conditions and, and that sort of thing. And then we'll take a look at some common diseases and how to control them. Um, not all diseases can be controlled. Um, some not all diseases need to be controlled. Some are just cosmetic um, and they're not life-threatening to the plant. So let's talk about diseases. A disease needs three things to develop. It has to have a pathogen, which is a disease organism. And that can be something like a fungus or a bacteria. Um, and then it has to have a susceptible host plant. So diseases are pretty choosy about which plants they have, have as hosts. And so you can have a disease organism in your garden, but if you're not growing a host plant that's able to get that disease, um, you won't have it. And then you also need conducive uh, environmental conditions. And that means... Um, if the host and the pathogen need, let's say, wet conditions or high humidity, um, and that occurs, you will probably get the disease. If, however, we have a summer like we have this year that's pretty dry and hot, um, we've had a lot less diseases of plants this year than some of the other years when we've had more rain and it's been more uh, wet and more higher humidity. So if you look at this triangle here, um, this green circle represents a susceptible host. The pathogen or the, the disease organism is the blue circle. And this um, kind of yellowish shaded circle is a favorable environment. So if you only have two of those things, you have no disease, any two. However, where they overlap and you have all three of them occurring at the same time, that's when a plant will develop a disease. So some ways we can uh, use then to control a, a disease is to take away one of these three things. Um, and I just talked about this. If you have squash plants growing in your garden that always get powdery mildew, one of the things you could do is to eliminate the pathogen but that's hard to do because it comes in on the wind or it might come from the soil. Um, you can change the host by planting a mildew resistant variety of squash, or you can change the environment somewhat. You can't control the weather, but you can change the environment by allowing plenty of air circulation, by spacing the plants far enough apart, letting them grow up on trellises, using a fungicide if you need to, um, but you can't change the weather that favors mildew. So in some years, you're going to get it no matter what. Okay. Um, many diseases can be controlled long before they even enter your garden. Um, buying disease-free plants and healthy seeds from reputable dealers goes a long way in keeping diseases out of your garden. Um, so look at plants when you're buying them. Um, if anything doesn't look right, um, that's one of, you know, you don't want to buy that plant. Also, um, seeds from reputable seed companies are more reliable than seeds you might pick up at a five and dime or um, a grocery store uh, or a Walmart, for example. Um, Another thing you can do is use good sanitation when starting seeds at home. So if you're seed starting uh, for, for plants for in your garden, make sure that you're using clean pots. You're using um, uh, seed starting mix, which is pretty sterile. Um, and you're using um, good um, circulation and that sort of thing. So that's one of the things you can do. Um, avoid moving soil um, within your garden, especially if one area, if you've had a disease in one area of your garden, um, try not to move that soil and mix it with other soil in the garden. Use clean equipment. Um, 
clean off the equipment, your shoes, the tires of wheelbarrows and, and all those kinds of things when you move from one part of the garden to the other. Another thing that you can do is to be very careful when sharing plants. Um, I know gardeners like to share plants, but if you are sharing plants, you may also be sharing some of the disease organisms. So check out um, if those plants that you're getting are susceptible to diseases or often have them from the person you're getting them from. Um, check out the sources of bulk mulch and compost. Those are other sources where you can bring in disease um, organisms. The one thing that most gardeners can do that helps a lot is to have good garden cleanup every year, not allowing those diseased plants to lay in the garden over winter. Um, clean them up before the snow flies and um, compost or um, bag them up and send them off in the trash or bury them. We'll talk about those uh, things um, in, on another slide. Um, but whatever is appropriate for the disease, you wanna make sure that you clean up your garden each year. Rotating crops. So if you have mildew on some plants in one part of your garden, you might move those to another part instead of growing the same crop again in that area because it's likely to have some disease organisms still remaining in the soil. And remove diseased plants and weeds promptly. There are some weeds that are in the same family as some of our uh, cultivated plants and they can get these diseases and then pass them on to our cultivated plants. So um, that's one thing that is uh, makes weeding really important besides the fact that um, the weeds um, um, take away from the nutrients and the sunshine and the, the water and everything from the plants that we have. And then removing diseased plants too. Once a plant gets a disease, um, generally it's not going to get over it. So uh, depending on how serious it is, um, sometimes removing the plant or removing some of the diseased leaves from a plant will help to keep it from spreading. Um, we're gonna talk about these um, common garden diseases. We have powdery mildew, septoria leaf spot, early blight, late blight, vascular wilts, esters yellow, common scab, common spot, blossom end rot. These last three are not really diseases. They're um, factors that are in the environment that can also affect plants. That's blossom end rot, walnut, walnut toxicity, and herbicide damage. So the first one we're gonna talk about is powdery mildew. Um, the pathogens, there's um, different powdery mildew fungi for each plant that can get powdery mildew. So if you have powdery mildew on peas, that's not the same powdery mildew that's on the squash or the cucumbers. Um, most powdery mildew is pretty much a cosmetic disease. However, there are is one group of plants, the cucumbers, squashes, pumpkins, that whole family. Um, if they get powdery mildew, the leaves fall off and the plant dies. So in that case, you would want to really keep a close eye on those plants for powdery mildew signs. Um, other vegetables like peas and tomatoes, it's mostly cosmetic. And many ornamentals we have in our garden too, like lilacs and bee balm, it's, those are also um, cosmetic signs. They don't look very nice, um, but um, they are usually not fatal to the plant. It'll, it might lose some leaves this year, but it'll come back the following year. The environment that is favorable to developing um, powdery mildew is high humidity. And I just saw some powdery mildew yesterday on the first of my squash plants to get it this year because we've had a dr really dry and um, warm summer so far. Um, so this is pretty late in the season for me to find um, powdery mildew, but I suspect there's going to be more after this week of high humidity and high temperatures. 
Um, these are some examples of what powdery mildew looks like. It looks like somebody sprinkled baby powder or talc on the leaves of the plants. You can see here it can affect flowers. Um, this up here is like a, um, well, not really a squash, maybe it's a cucumber leaf. But anyway, powdery mildew has white spots. Downy mildew has these yellow spots, and that's a whole different disease. It's not near as common as powdery mildew, but it is a pretty serious disease of uh, cucurbits or squash type plants. So it's a squash leaf. This is a bean leaf. Um, so many different kinds of plants can get the, the um, powdery mildew. What do you do to control it? Um, remove the disease plant material and debris. So if you pull out a plant, make sure you pick up all the dead leaves around it and any mulch that you may have had under that plant. And I'm gonna talk about the three methods we often say to use to control um, disease plant material. And then when I say these, I'm not gonna go into big depth of discussion about them each time. Burning, um, where it's allowed, a lot of municipalities will not allow you to burn, but that's one way that you can control um, powdery mildew diseased material. Deep bury means to bury the uh, plant material deep enough that it's not going to be um, dug up by critters or uh, the soil washed away and expose it by heavy rain, that sort of thing. And the other one is to hot compost. That means the compost pile has to reach about 160 degrees um, and it has to be turned often um, and it, in order to get the, um, the uh, spores from the plant uh, disease killed. Um, most home compost piles do not reach that high of a temperature. Uh, commercial compost piles um, can reach that high of a temperature. Um, another thing you can do um, to kind of prevent it more than control it is reduce the humidity. So plant less densely. In other words, more space between plants. Um, if you have flowers that usually get it, thin the flower stands a little bit so that there's more air movement. And at no time should you be watering the leaves of the plant. You always want to water the soil, surface of the soil, not the leaves. Um, another thing to do is resistant cultivars or varieties. Um, and when you look in a seed catalog, or sometimes it will say on a, on a plant tag, um, it'll have a series of letters. Um, and each of the letters stand for a certain type of resistance. Um, PM is usually powdery mildew. Um, v is verticillium. There's, there, there will be a key in your garden catalog that will tell you what the different letters mean. And then use fungicides if the infections continue for years on favored plants. And um, the fungicide that you use will depend on whether or not you have pollinators in the area. Um, what kind of plant you have. And so you would want to research a little bit about a specific type of fungicide to use on the plant that you have. Um, the next one is septoria leaf spot. And I'm going to talk about this with early blight because they are hard to tell apart. And a lot of times people will have both on them. This is a plant uh, disease of the uh, tomato and potato family, um, somewhat on peppers and eggplants, but the, by and far and large, the tomatoes and potatoes um, usually get these. And uh, the favorable environment is, again, cool or warm, wet weather. Um, Septoria leaf spot over here on the left side, you have numerous brown spots um, a 16th to an eighth of an inch in diameter. Um, and they may have black specks in the middle, but there's no halo around the spots. Early blight looks a little bit different and you can have both of these on the same plant. Um, the spots are larger. They're a quarter to a half an inch in diameter. They have tan or brown in the middle 
And if you look closely, you can see what looks like the rings of a tree when you cut down a tree, these concentric circles. And they often have this yellow halo around the brown spot. So um, the disease itself looks a little bit different, but the plant may have both at the same time. Um, both start on the lower leaves of the plant. They usually do not affect the fruit. Um, the spotted leaves um, get more and more spots and they die prematurely and then fall off the plant. Sometimes they just are brown and hang on the plant. Um, but what happens then is the fruit is exposed to the sun and it gets sun scald, uh, resulting in poor fruit flavor and color. Sun scald is that yellow appearance oftentimes on the top of a tomato or the side of the tomato that's towards the um, sun. Severely spotted leaves um, will sometimes fall off the plant. The fungus is not soil borne, but it can overwinter on residue from previous crops, decaying vegetation, and some wild hosts related to tomato, like evening nightshade is one that's in the same family. If you know what that weed is, it's a vining weed and it gets um, purple and yellow flowers and then it gets bunches of red um, berry looking things that eventually turn black. Um, Septoria leaf spot likes high humidity in that range of about 68 to 77 degrees. So today would be a really good day um, where you might get a start of Septoria leaf spot. Um, early blight causes the fruit to drop and spoil, um, and it's found on infested seed, debris from infected plants that are left in or on the soil, and it can survive at least a year, and spores from other affected plants that are um, usually dispersed short distances by wind, water, insect, or animals. Um, it has roughly the same um, temperature range, um, a little bit larger range than septoria leaf spot, and again, high humidity. Uh, control for both is the same. You in destroy the infested plants by burning or burying them. Don't compost them. Um, rotate vegetables to different parts of your garden so that if there's any debris that may have remained in the garden, because um, the leaves got brown, they got dry, they crackled, they fell apart, and it stayed in the soil when you pulled the rest of the plant. Um, another thing you can do is use resistant uh, varieties wherever it's possible. Um, early blight does have some resistant varieties. Septoria has only one or two varieties that I'm aware of that are resistant because the gene that controls flavor is on the same part of the chromosome as the gene that would make the plant resistant to disease. So if you take that gene out, um, you might also take the flavor gene with it. So that's, it's very hard to do sometimes to get a good tasting tomato that would be resistant to um, septoria leaf spot. Um, another thing, increase the spacing between plants to increase the airflow and decrease the humidity um, and allow the foliage to dry faster if it's got dew on it uh, or rain. Um, prune as many suckers from indeterminate tomato plants as you can. Um, you leave the first um, sucker underneath the, the first fruit cluster and then from then on, um, you need to prune the suckers so that you only have one or two main stems um, with fruit clusters on them. Um, you can mulch your garden with approximately an inch of high quality mulch, but don't go overboard with the mulch because this would hold humidity and um, keep the soil wet and that would increase humidity towards the bottom part of the plant and that's what the plant um, disease likes. Where the disease has been a real problem for many years, um, people may use uh, copper spray or chlorothalonil th um, fungicide that's labeled for use on vegetables. Um, 
it's going to, you're going to have to treat it like every week for the whole season. Um, and you have to start before the disease is present. Once it's started, you can't stop it. So um, some people decide they're going to go through all that work and other people decide, well, I'm just going to keep picking tomatoes or potatoes or whatever, as long as the plant's healthy and then I'm done. So it's up to you. Late blight, um, by the way, early blight and late blight don't necessarily occur early in the summer and late in the summer. Either one can occur at any time. Um, this is a really serious disease and it affects tomatoes and potatoes. And again, the environment is cool, wet weather. It's highly destructive. It can wipe out all the plants in a row or in a field um, in a matter of a week. Um, this is the disease that um, back in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, this is what caused the great potato famine or the great famine in Ireland. Um, people had small gardens at that time which uh, they grew for their own family's use. And they plants got this disease and they died, but the people kept the potatoes because you kept the potatoes to use for seed potatoes the next year. Well, um, the potatoes might not have looked too bad, um, so they planted them. And then the following year, um, the disease, they just planted the disease right in the ground with the plants. And so they got the disease again that year and they had no potato crop. And this happened a couple years in a row and um, people starved by the millions and millions more uh, emigrated to other countries, United States, Australia, um, you know, anywhere where they could because they uh, were starving to death in Ireland. But this is what the disease looks like. Um, once it starts, you can have a whole row of tomatoes that are just turn to mush um, in a week or so. It affects the fruits, so you don't get any fruits out of it. It starts with kind of a, a greasy, water-soaked kind of looking patch. Um, it can be on the leaves, it can be on the stems, or it can be on both, and um, it progresses very rapidly. So it's, it's not a disease to be um, taken lightly. In fact, our um, state um, agriculture department, the university extension department has monitoring in the potato fields in Wisconsin because we are a big potato growing state as well as a fair amount of tomatoes. And um, if this disease gets started in a field, it can wipe out a whole field. So they're monitoring constantly um, about where, where this disease is, where it might be appearing and as soon as that disease um, is found on any field anywhere, the message immediately goes out from the extension to all the growers that says it's been found in, in this, this county, you know, in this field. And then there's different types and they um, use like a DNA sample to figure out the type of um, late blight organism it is. And then they have very specific um, sprays and that sort of thing that they use to control it or prevent it. Um, the control, um, you need to destroy an infected plant right away. Pull it, roots and all, bag it up tightly um, and let it heat in the sun for several days and then send it out to the trash. Um, don't keep volunteer tomato or potato plants that come up in your garden. Um, don't use tubers for seed the following year and destroy any nightshade weeds because nightshade can also transfer or hold this disease. Um, discard any tubers, potato tubers that you might find in the spring. Um, spray with fungicides prior to infection, especially in cool, wet weather. Um, the potato farmers are probably out there spraying like crazy in the last day or so. Um, because of the kind of weather we have uh, forecast for this week. Do not compost any infected plant parts. Um, and that includes like, don't throw the tomatoes in the compost pile, even though you take the whole plant and put it in the garbage. 
um, plant tolerant or resistant varieties. Um, if you can, plant several kinds of tomatoes or potatoes um, so that if one variety is more susceptible, you may be able to salvage the other varieties. Um, always water the soil, not the foliage. Make sure that you plant the plants far enough apart for good air circulation. And if you have any suspicion that you have late blight in your garden, send a sample and it's probably send a picture first, but then follow up with a sample um, to the PDDC, that's the Plant Diagnostic Disease Diagnostic Clinic down in Madison. They will free for free test your tomato or potato um, to make sure that you don't have this because this is such an important disease to control in Wisconsin. Um, we're gonna switch now to a different kind of disease organism. These are vascular wilts and there's two main ones, Fusarium and Verticillium. Um, the hosts are many different kinds of plants. Um, almost anything can get these, including plants, shrubs, trees, weeds. Um, the favorable, favorable environment is wet weather to get infected and then dry weather for symptom development because it's not until the weather dries out and the plant gets a little stressed that you're going to see the effects of the disease. Um, if you cut open the stem of a plant that's showing disease, um, you will find underneath in this area, right underneath the like skin of the plant or the bark of a, uh, a shrub, um, this brown layer, that's the water conducting tissue. Um, in a tree, it would be the layer right underneath the bark. Um, and that's all clogged up. What this disease does is clog up the water uh, transporting part of the plant. And what you'll usually see is there might be one branch or one half of a plant that looks like this, all wilted, and the other half may not be wilted right away, but eventually it probably will. Um, this is an example on eggplants showing some signs of um, not getting enough water or nutrients. Um, control, uh, rotate crops to avoid buildup. Do not plant susceptible plants in infested areas. Uh, sometimes you may have to wait even several years before planting another plant in the same area. Plant non-hosts in the effect in the infested areas. Sweet corn is one of the few vegetables that's immune to um, the wilts. So you could plant a lot of sweet corn if you have these, this problem in your garden. Um, plant resistant varieties, look for VFF after the name of the plant in a seed catalog. Um, keep weeds out of the garden. Do not overwater, do not over mulch, and do not use mulch from apple, um, or maple, ash, uh, trees which may have died of the disease. Those trees are more susceptible than some other kinds. Don't bother using any fungicides or biological controls because they won't help. Um, destroy the plant by burning or bagging and putting it out in the trash. Don't compost it or bury it and disinfect all tools that have come into contact with the plant because the sap can be transferred to another plant when you use that tool on, on another plant. Um, asters yellow is kind of a funny name. Um, it doesn't affect just asters, but it's, um, that's, that's what it's called. And when I show you the pictures on another slide here, you'll see, probably recognize this. Um, many plants are susceptible to it. Um, the thing that causes it is a phytoplasma, which is kind of a little living organism, um, sort of like uh, an amoeba. Um, and in order for a plant to get it, it has to be fed on by an aster leaf hopper. And when the aster leaf hopper uh, feeds on a plant that has this disease in the, the sap of the plant, 
and then it goes and feeds on another one, it transfers the disease. So I'll show you this. You probably may have seen this. On carrots and those kinds of things, it causes rusty leaves like this. And it would also cause these kind of hairy stems on the carrot. On flowers, often instead of the flowers, you'll get this green mass of stuff. And it doesn't look anything like the flower of the plant. Um, one plant that gets this fairly often is um, goldenrod. If you have a field of goldenrod and you walk through it, you will probably find this on at least some of the goldenrod plants. Um, one, one, it'll have a couple of really nice flowers and then it'll have this green blob of stuff that just looks like a whole bunch of little leaves all growing in one space. Um, and it can cause like different kind of growth things on branches and stuff too. It's um, kind of a weird disease. Okay, um, what do you do to control it? Get rid of any diseased plants, um, not just the part that uh, looks funny. You have to take out the whole plant. And again, you can hot compost it, bury it or burn it. But remember that most home gardeners don't have a hot enough compost pile. If you could control the leaf hopper, that would be great, but a leaf hopper goes pretty quickly from one plant to another. So it's hot, pretty hard to do that. And you might wanna plant less susceptible plants. Um, I, we know that cone flowers are one that gets at, um, and I said um, the Canadian goldenrod that you see big fields of around here, that often is something that gets it too. The next one is common scab. If you plant potatoes um, or some other root crops, you might have run into this. Um, the favorable environment is a high soil pH. So you may have the pathogen, but if your soil is more on the acid side, the sour side, you may not even develop it. Um, and what it looks like on potatoes um, is these bumpy, like a scab, or it can be a raised area, or it can be a bunch of little uh, ones. And on carrots, you also have these kind of scabby looking things. Um, so how do you control it? Make sure that you have scab free potato stock. So um, check your source of your um, seed potatoes. Routinely rotate crops. Don't grow host plants in, in an area that had it infested the year before or even two years before. Um, move potatoes to another location. Plant scab resistant varieties. Lower the soil pH. And you can have a soil test done at the university um, soils lab for about $15, $20. And that will tell you if your soil pH is too high. Um, it's not worth using any kind of chemicals or anything else on it because it's not gonna do any good. Um, common smut, um, it, and the host is sweet corn, and you may have seen this on sweet corn. Um, the favorable environment, there really is none, but what you can do to prevent it is not to injure the plant because that tends to um, allow the organism in. And it looks like this, it looks like kind of like mushrooms growing on the corn. Um, and um, it usually develops on the top of the ear of corn, although you may find it inside the, the leaves too. Um, plant resistant varieties for control, uh, reduce any kind of physical damage like uh, be careful when you're weeding that you don't um, bump the plants, nick the plants, um, bruise them. Um, no chemicals or biological controls will do anything for it. And believe it or not, corn smut is considered a delicacy in some parts of the world. Yulakoche is called. And people grow corn specifically and inoculate it with this organism so that they grow the smut. So 
you can either have your corn or you can have your smut. Um, we're going to be moving now to blossom end rot, and this is not a disease. The cause of it is a calcium deficiency, and you're likely to find it on tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and then the cucurbit family, like squashes and pumpkins and that sort of thing. Um, a favorable environment is drought, especially not giving the plants enough water when they're very small and the fruits are first um, developing. Usually you will find this only on the first couple of fruits that you pick off of each plant. Um, once the plant gets big enough, um, it can draw enough water that the, the fruits after that are usually fine. And what it looks like is a brown spot can be big, can be small. Um, on the bottom, on the what would have been the flower end opposite the stem end, so like the flower end of the fruit. And um, here's one on like a melon. And this is a, I think that's supposed to be an eggplant. And sometimes it will look like this on peppers. It, you'd swear that that's sun scald, but it's not. It, and it would probably be the lowest peppers on a plant. And you will find on tomatoes, it's the lowest pep, the lowest tomatoes on the plant, the first ones that would get ripe. Um, what's happening is the, the plant is not taking up enough water and the, the foliage is growing so fast that it's using all the calcium and it's kind of starving those first fruits of calcium. And so um, there's really nothing you can do a lot about it. Some people add calcium or they uh, crush up eggshells and put them in with their tomato plants. Um, but usually it's not a problem of how much calcium you have. It's a problem of watering at the time that the plants um, are really young. Um, so you want to water uniformly and adequately. You don't want to overwater or underwater, and you want to keep that water supply pretty steady, especially as the first fruits begin to set. Also take care not to damage roots if you're hoeing around plants, because if you damage the roots, then the plant can't take up enough water and then you may get this also. And also to keep the soil water level pretty even between watering, you can mulch with about an inch of mulch and that will keep the, the um, top of the soil from drying out too fast. Um, if you need calcium, uh, it's suggested that you use bone meal, um, eggshells, but it's going to take a couple of years for those eggshells to really uh, break down and be able to be taken up by the plant. Don't use lime, okay, um, in most cases. Again, a soil test might well tell you whether you or not you even need to add the calcium. Um, the next one is walnut toxicity, and the cause is the juglones um, in the walnut tree. Black walnuts are the most common ones and have the strongest um, effect on plants. Butternuts and hickories have milder effects, but can also affect really sensitive plants. Um, many vegetables are affected by the juglones. Um, the, the potato, tomato, pepper, eggplant family um, is especially sensitive to that, also asparagus and cabbage. Um, and this sometimes happens, people don't even know that they had at one time many years ago, a black walnut tree where they put their garden. Um, and people will say, well, I have a black walnut tree, but it's like 30 feet from my garden. Well, tree roots go out about three times as tall as the plant is or beyond the drip line. So you can have roots from a tree quite a ways away from um, a plant, uh, a tree trunk. What it looks like is just kind of the plants look really sickly and in many cases they will actually die. You get kind of a wilting effect like this um, and eventually they start dying. You know, the leaves start turning brown and falling off. And this is a field where this here is your walnut tree right here. 
and you can see the effects of it across what looks like a path or a, a, a farm road. And you can see that it affects plants way out into the field here and beyond where the, the tree roots go, the plants look fine. So um, it can affect quite a ways away from the tree. Um, don't plant sensitive plants near walnut trees. Um, the beans, carrots, melons, parsnips, beets, corn, onions, and squash are more tolerant vegetables. These would be ones that wouldn't be as affected as badly by the jug loan. Um, if you want to raise sensitive vegetables, um, you need to raise, put up a raised bed and it has to have a bottom in it too so that the roots can't from the vegetables can't go down into soil and touch the area where the uh, walnut roots are. Um, or you can grow them in pots. Um, and then um, you also want to be sure that the walnut leaves and fruits don't land in your garden when they fall off the tree. Um, don't compost with walnut leaves or fruits. Um, don't use the leaves as mulch. Um, remove any volunteer walnut trees that show up in your garden. Squirrels like to plant them all over the place, so you'll oftentimes find them growing there. Um, one solution might be to remove a mature walnut tree, but that might not be your first choice. If you really like that tree and it's a, a good shade tree for your yard and um, you maybe even use the nuts, um, and just remember that removing the tree is not going to remove the roots um, that will be under the ground and this effect of this jug loan can last 10 years or more. Um, I had, there are fact sheets um, that are in the resources for each one of the diseases that I've talked about and the black walnut fact sheet has a list of plants by sensitivity to black uh, walnut jug loan. So that would be a good place to check to see if you can plant uh, a particular plant near a black walnut tree. And the last one we're going to talk about is herbicide damage. And this happens more often than people realize. Um, your garden will be looking fine, your plants look fine, and all of a sudden you go out there one day and they look kind of twisted and a little bit yellow um, and you wonder well, what's going on. I don't see any bugs. I don't see anything wrong. Um, and what has often happened is uh, somewhere near your garden, either you or maybe a neighbor um, sprayed with a weed killer and the ingredients 2,4-D and dicamba are really good at producing this herbicide damage. Um, it kills weeds if it's applied in great, great enough concentration, but if it drifts or blows on the wind into your garden or your uh, yard, um, you will have the plants affected slightly. It may not kill them, but it will affect them. All vegetables and most landscape plants are sensitive to the herbicides that we use in weed killers. Tomatoes are especially sensitive. Um, and so you'll see things like this, a, a kind of a spiraling or twisting of a stem. You'll see um, kind of small but um, bent or um, twisted um, leaves on a stem. Sometimes it produces kind of a, a bumpy, um, spotty kind of effect on leaves. Um, here you can see where it kind of has the bean leaves, the edges just kind of turning under and everything looks like it's kind of been um, puffed up but pulled together at the same time. It's, it's kind of a weird effect. Um, so these are some of the common effects of plants if it doesn't kill your plant entirely. Um, so how do you manage it? Don't use herbicides. 
Um, if you or your neighbors do use herbicides, make sure that you or they follow the application direct, uh, directions exactly. Um, never apply an herbicide if the wind is greater than five miles an hour. Um, even at five miles an hour, it's likely that you could get some drift um, from the uh, applied area to a plant that you don't want it applied to. And um, keep a, a, a fairly wide distance from any plants that are susceptible to it. Um, use low pressure when you're applying it. If you're using a sprayer um, or you have something attached to a hose, um, don't use the highest pressure that you have. And then there's two formulations of herbicides and you might wanna check the label when you buy them. There's an amine formula and an ester formula. The amine formula is less likely to volatize or evaporate into the air and be drawn to an area where you don't want it. The ester form vaporizes more easily and therefore even at low wind speeds, it can be um, taken by the wind and um, go to an area where you don't want it to be um, applied. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, yeah. The other thing is if you have some suggestions for future programs, would you can also put those in the, the uh, chat box too. Um, I always end up with this information. Um, if you're trying to find accurate, reliable information, enter your search question and add the word extension or the phrase site colon dot edu. So for an example, you would have spots on tomato leaves extension or spots on tomato leaves site colon dot edu. And that's going to bring up the... Um, extension sites from, it could be anywhere in the United States, and sometimes you even get some from foreign countries. Um, and then you choose um, one of the states that's close to Wisconsin or has a similar climate. So if you were doing this, you would probably choose something um, from the University of Minnesota, um, Illinois, Wisconsin, maybe the Dakotas, you would probably be less likely to choose something from North or South Carolina or Georgia because their climate is so much different and their growing conditions. So you wanna choose something that is um, uh, a website that's coming from a state that's nearby or that has a similar climate. Even though it's not nearby, New York um, is would have a similar climate, for example. Um, and this will give you information that's been tested and researched by university people. Um, and so um, if I, I just had a question the other day and I put it in and did this and I had I got up a couple of um, sites and um, the information was very good. Um, if you just go on the Internet and say spots on tomatoes, you have no idea where the information is coming from, who's writing it, have they researched it? Um, are they just blogging? You know, they're sitting down and writing something um, interesting maybe to pe for people to read, but not entirely very accurate. So um, use this type of um, way to... Um, look up for information. Now, I, we lo we're we losing some stuff here um, on the bottom. Um, the other thing that I will leave up here for a while while I speak is the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic. Um, this is the mailing address on the top part of the page. It's Department of Plant Pathology, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, the website, um, if you just type in PDDC into uh, a, a browser, it's going to bring this up. It's, it's so well searched or so often searched. Um, 
And this is another way you can get to it. And you can send photos there. And the people down at the lab, um, Brian Huddleston is the main person. Oftentimes he can diagnose something by a really good photo. So take as close up photo as you can, but it has to be clear. And if you, if you can get a clear photo that's not so close, that's better than a close up that's not clear. Um, and then if he can't tell you what it looks like um, by a photo, he'll ask you to send a physical sample in for diagnosis. And on this website, there's all kinds of directions on how to take the sample, how to package the sample, how to send the sample. Um, and most of the diagnoses are around $15, $20. Um, sometimes he has to do a really detailed or expensive uh, expensive test to try and figure out a disease, um, and then it might run more. Remember that potato and tomato samples, if you suspect at all that you have a tomato or potato disease, those are free because they want to be sure that they get those diagnosed as soon as possible. Um, he's also got a Facebook page, a Twitter, a YouTube, um, and if you want to get information from him on a regular basis about plant diseases and that sort of thing, you can also subscribe to a listserv and he will send you articles. Um, for example, um, one of them was 10 um, diseases you can identify by eye. You know, you don't even have to, you know, test for them or anything. You just know what they are. Um, it's, a, it's a really neat site. And then um, beyond there, he's got a list of um, appearances that he makes, programs that he does. Um, and then there's fact sheets there for each one of the diseases that we've talked about and many, many, many more. Um, you can go on there and look up a fact sheet and it will tell you all about the disease, what causes it, how to control it, um, what plants are affected by it and all that sort of thing. Um, if you look at the resource sheet from this, um, this month, I have listed the fact sheets for each one of the diseases that I talked about. And like I said, there's fact sheets for way, lots, lots more. Um, so if you want to know anything about a particular disease, once you get it um, figured out what it is, then you can go on there and find these fact sheets. And they're usually one or two side um, paper that's very concise. Um, so uh, it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful resource um, for people to look up anything about diseases. Um, Madison also has an insect lab where they identify insects, they have um, weeds, they have a lawn lab or turf lab. Um, I, there's, there's just a whole bunch of good resources down there. So if you ever get stuck your county extension agent can um, steer you how to get to all these places. So um, let's see what's here. I guess the last thing is if we have any questions and we don't have any. Okay. Um, well, I thank you for um, watching this program and um, we'll be back again next month with one on succulents growing succulents. So I guess for now, we'll say so long and see you next month.